John, a real pleasure to meet you. Nice to meet you, Pat. John, I'm looking at uh, all your news releases, and you've been one busy guy, but it, I, I think it boils down to three near production kind of elements. Uh, the Buckeye Mine, uh, Washington Mine, and the uh, third-party milling that you're doing. So let's start with the Buckeye. What's the latest there? Well, the latest is we are now finalizing or completing our uh, requirements under MSHA, and that is we have to rock bolt the entire uh, um, add it all the way from the portal right to the mine face. Uh, that's ongoing as we speak. We are about 15 feet away from getting out of the hard rock. And when I say hard rock is the host rock is very, very hard. It's, it's a diabase and it's some people say it's harder than the hubs of hell. And when you have to drill, you have to drill into that structure six feet and then you have to put a rock bolt in and then screen over top of it and lock it in place. We're going through um, one bit every two or three holes on that. Normally, we can get a dozen holes out of it. But we're almost through that now. And then we're a straight shot to the vein. And then we can start drilling and blasting. And we, we're about three to four rounds away from what we believe to be the high grade zone. And we're seeing that indicated in the assay values we're getting right now. So we are very close in the Buckeye to start to produce producing and, and start to producing on a regular basis. Uh, down at the mill, where the Buckeye ore is going to be shipped, we're ready to go. We've upgraded the, the starter with an electronic starter to allow us to get more capacity out of the mill. We've replaced our pumps that we, we found in our pilot plant runs that need to be done. We've made all the adjustments. We're working with an engineering group right now, which is my former business partner, and, and we are working together to put together a, a flotation circuit so we can handle some of the different kinds of wars that are there. Also pick up some of the residual silver that's not being got in our, in our gravity and also start to um, recover some of the copper because we've got a lot of copper in our ore as well. So that's what we're doing right now at the Buckeye. Okay, the Buckeye. so that's Arizona covered. Let's get over to Idaho and the Washington mine because... Yep. Uh, I was reading a little bit of the history on the mine, and it was actually operational back in the 1930s. Oh yeah, yeah. It, uh, it's 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 a it's a very fascinating story. It was started in the 1890s, I believe 1893, and then they were running one ounce per ton um, uh, gold, straight gold. But unfortunately, they didn't have the technology to mine the silver, so they blocked it out with the intention of coming back in and and coming back in to get it. And also they found there's gold still down below and then there's a parallel zone, which we have subsequently found. So back in the 1930s, they came back in, they put a mill on it to process the silver. You know what happened to silver in the 1930s when I think it was when the US government gold standard silver went through the floor, it went down to pennies. So it, the mill sat there for years until it finally rotted away. But that ore body, I'll call it an ore body. It's not really because it can't be an ore body until it's got it's got a feasibility study to support it. But that mineralized material that's there has been sitting there all this time. In the 1980s, the gentleman that we bought the property from, he went in and he pulled out a bulk sample, which he sent to Hecla to mine to mill for him. And that milling came out 44 ounces of silver and 0.1 ounce per ton gold. So we know it's there. Uh, we are now preparing to start the decline to get to the attic. And that will be, once that's done, we're about 80 feet to that known mineralized zone that was done back in the 1980s. So we've got good data, good information that's available to us to give us a comfort level that we're going to go in and at least initially start with that 40 ounce material. Now, that's all history, as you know. It's not 43101 compliant, but it's also done by some pretty credible people. This was not done by the Stoker Report, which is on our website. You read that, and you'll get exactly what I'm talking about. Now, subsequent to that, we've also identified and brought to surface the parallel burger vein, and we're going to go underground, and part of our development there is to drift over to the burger vein, which you're back into 0.3 ounce per ton gold historically. So it is a fascinating property. It needs to be developed. 
remember this area we're in was the highest grade placer gold area in Idaho. So the gold and the gold didn't fall from the sky. It came from somewhere. And we think this is one of the areas it came from and we own it outright. It's no, there's no NSRs. There's no, uh, you know, BLM claims to be paid. We have the timber rights. So all the timber that we use to build the, to build the structures on the property, we use our own timber. We have a portable sawmill comes in, cuts it for us and we pay them with, excess timber so i think we've got a really good property there that's got a lot of potential not just right away but future as well yeah and then this third party milling uh and as i saw it was some kind of a revenue sharing potential uh where do we stand on that well there's multiple opportunities in arizona you remember remember that movie whatever it was field of dreams you build it and they will come Yes. Well, that's us in a way. We have a mill that's capable, and that's why we're having that problem. That's why we're having these, trying to get everything straightened out and know where we're coming from. No ore body's the same or no, you know, none of these are, everybody's different. Everybody's got a different ore pile. So what we're trying to do is, is make sure that we can handle all of these. But nobody else in the area has got a mill like ours. The next mill to us is Freeport Macrams. It's 10,000 tons a day. So they're not interested in what we're doing. But so what we've gone is we've gone around and we've tested two or three now and we're, you know, and we're, we're moving forward on that because we can actually be the guy where they bring it to and we process it and pay them for it. There, there's three, oper three ways of doing this. You either just buy the mine and then we do all the work, right? Uh, you, you, you pay a tolling fee whereas they come in and then, you know, you 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 pay them for the ore that they bring in. And then the third one's obviously is just charge them so much a ton to process it. But in our case, you know, we're looking at we want to build that up and build multiple little mines in the area and, and, and process the and make money. Because the nice thing about that is you don't have all that, you know, the mining costs and the M shaws and everything like that. So we can actually process it. So that's what we're doing. So some of them are going to work. Others won't. Some of them will have require a float cell. Some don't require a float cell. So that's what we're doing, putting a float circuit in or engineering to put a float circuit in so that we don't have to worry about that. We can bring it in from all over the place. So It's almost like kind of gravy. Part. It's almost gravy. like gravy on roast beef. Exactly what it is. And that's exactly what we're treating it as because we can take it and stockpile it. Remember, we've got a large area there. So we can stockpile different ore bodies, you know, different ore piles, put them all in piles. Right. And then feed them to our fine ore bin or our coarse ore bin, you know, as, as we can mix and blend depending on what the what the, the the business model is for that. You know, we can mix and blend with other ones. I mean, there's so many opportunities there. But again, it takes time to do this properly, number one, and make sure you make money. There's no point doing it if you're going to lose money. That's like kissing your sister. John, I, I mean, you've gone through M. Sean. You there were a little bit of delays as I read there, uh, but uh, you're near production, Buckeye, and then potentially, I guess, at Washington as well. What's our timeline looking at? Are we looking at like very soon, or are we looking a year or two away? Oh no, we're looking at very soon. My problem is that I, I made, you know, I made these commitments back three years ago that I thought we'd be in production now. You know, I didn't realize that I, at the time I didn't know there was going to be a pandemic. I didn't know that there was going to be all these, you know, heat, unbelievable heat. And, and you can you can only mitigate against certain risks, obviously. But, you know, we're, we're very soon. Like Peter's word is, Peter Clausey's word is, we're, you know, production is imminent. Uh, just a quick question, because one of the other um, research notes I saw talked about your share structure, uh, and you see that as one major benefit. Oh, definitely. I mean, when you look at what we've done and how we've done this and how we've you know, managed to keep the wheels on the bus and moving forward and, and, and do what we've done and, and everything you see on that pictures and all the equipment and everything we own it i don't have to make a payment at the end of the month on the lease for the mucker or the or the jar or the cone or anything like that we own it all and we've only got 70 million shares outstanding you know i mean to me and, and most and you know half of that or 30 million or 35 or 40 million of it is is close held in by insiders 
I mean, when you when you think about what we've accomplished and still only have 70 million shares outstanding, 69 million four hundred and ninety three thousand eight hundred and twenty nine. You know, when you look at that and you go like I see junior explorers that own nothing, that have 300 million shares outstanding, 150 million, 250 million. We've got 70 million shares outstanding. So I, I, I just look at that as from a shareholder standpoint that that's pretty darn good for a junior mining company that has everything we have. And like I said, we own everything from the assay facility all the way through. And in Idaho, it's the same way. Everything is ours. And if we had to replace it, it would cost us millions of dollars. How many June, when I use this adage, you as a junior explorer, you go out and you find a property and you bring a drill in and you drill the property and you drill, you spend $5 million drilling, which is not a big drill program, but you spend $5 million drilling. At the end of it, you don't own the drill. The drill company walks away, drives away, and he takes the drill with him. All you're left with is the core and the core boxes and a big bill. With us, if nothing happens, at the end of the day, uh, we still own everything. It's all ours. It may real not be assets. Real John, life, but it's ours. Yeah, real assets. John, thanks so much for your time. Look forward to talking in the future. Okay, thank you, Pat. Appreciate your taking the time and uh, look forward to future conversations.